Well, thank you, Chairman, and what a uh, beautiful segue to my uh, question, which was going to have to do with the our relationship with you. And um, during one of the reforms that I managed in Rhode Island, we had an actuarial firm looking over our shoulder so that we could quantify the savings that we needed to take out of a system. And uh, in my experience, there were things that the actuarial firm recommended because they could quantify them, because actuarial science lent itself to the calculation of that particular mode of reform. And there were other things that they couldn't evaluate. And we had to make a policy decision. And in one case, we decided to not go the path where they could quantify the reform because we just felt it wouldn't work. And instead, we did something that they gave us literally zero credit for. And they said to us, look, you're probably doing the right thing here. But because we don't have that experience you talked about, because we can't look back at proven evidence, we're disabled from telling you officially that this will work. And what I worry about is that we are headed into, I think, a fiscal crisis that is going to make the current economic problem look like a picnic. I mean, if you look at $35 trillion in unfunded Medicare liability bearing down on us inevitably, and we're fighting now over a $700, $800 billion bill as if that were the end of the world, $35 trillion is just enormous. And we have to get after that. And I have two concerns about your actuarial science. One, there is a limited amount of evidence. And so you're very limited in what you can sign off on in terms of scoring. And two, areas that we've been talking about, like health information infrastructure and investment in quality reform that saves money and reimbursement reform end up being dynamically inter-engaged. We had a witness who came here and said, uh, use the example of a toaster. You test putting the toast in the oven, in the toaster, and you take it back out, didn't work. You test putting the lever down, didn't work. You test plugging it in, didn't work. Nothing made toast, nothing will work. But if you plug it in and put the toast in and then push it down, boom, toast. And so there's the second worry, which is that it's very hard for somebody in your position with your the restrictions, the professional restrictions that you have to operate under to try to quantify those dynamic interactions that can make the difference between an information technology system that just sits on doctors' desks and another one that saves potentially, according to RAND, $350 billion a year. What do we do about that? And does there need to be some new entity of some kind established that can provide the kind of dynamic oversight that we need for these dynamic interactions between the different types of solution necessary to turn this around uh, in the short period of time before the $35 trillion hits us. And, and then we're in trouble that makes today's troubles look like, you know, they're troubles in a minor key. Uh, how much I, can we I, count on you through this? And how much do your limitations make you a, a partner but not a f complete guide in all of this. So I agree entirely with your concern, Senator. I, um, CBO is going to draw on uh, existing evidence about the effects of changes. And that evidence will be um, weak in many cases. And it will be particularly weak in cases that involve the interactions of several policy changes. Um, we have a fair amount of evidence related to incremental changes that, uh, and policies that have been in place for a long time because almost everything has been moved up and down and you can see how the world has responded to that. We have uh, very little evidence about interlocking changes in the complex healthcare system. And I don't think that our numbers should be the uh, ultimate determinant of the policies that you and your colleagues will uh, vote for and against. Um, we'll have to make some leaps of faith based on our best judgments. Yes. Now, however, 
let me say, I think we can be of great service to you in judging what leaps are worth taking. Yep. There are leaps of faith that lead to people falling into the chasm, and there are leaps of faith that have at least a passing chance of grabbing hold on the other side. And our expertise, I think, can be very valuable to you in judging what leaps to take. As I said, I think there is a um, fairly broad consensus about some of the overall direction that the healthcare system should move in to make it more effective and cost efficient. Much less agreement about specifically what steps will do that. Is it um, medical homes? Is it accountable care organizations? Is it greater bundling of hospitals care and post-acute care? Is it health IT? Is it, there's a whole list of these possibilities. I think there's a tendency in discussions of healthcare to view one of them as the silver bullet or to dismiss it as a failure because it is not the silver bullet. I think, in fact, most analysts believe that we need to try a set of policies. Some will uh, be duds or even counterproductive. Others will turn out to be more effective than we anticipate. Um, and that trying, though, will mean doing things that we, and some of those things we should anticipate will fail. And that is, the, in a sense, the leap of faith that I think needs to be taken. But again, choosing what leaps to take, I think um, we can be very, not all leaps are the same. And how far you leap and ways of doing demonstration projects and changes that have a long run goal, which is a quite different system perhaps, but move there incrementally so that indirect effects in the rest of the system can be evaluated are ways of reducing the risk associated with those leaps.